when I ran across the material, I just thought this is the most amazing story that I've ever run across, certainly in federal science. It goes right into the image of this classic character, the up by your bootstraps character in American culture, the independent inventor, the person who comes up with a miraculous solution to some society need. Jess Ritchie had a charisma, a life story, and a trajectory that worked to his benefit for the people that he was influencing in his favor. Populism was in the mainstream at the time, and he could project that. Alan Aston was the polar opposite. He was quiet, very reserved. He saw himself primarily as a bench scientist and then as an administrator of an army of bench scientists. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. ADX-2 came to the market in 1947, right after World War II. Tensions were high among governments and among the public. Lead was a strategic material. It was expensive, and it was in short supply. And therefore, battery manufacturers had a great demand to produce batteries and actually felt threatened by this lone individual with a packet of powder. Assault. He correctly saw that there would be a great possibility to make a business out of this and a very profitable one. One night, near exhaustion, I began processing a fresh batch of chemicals. Then I forgot all about it for four days. No. We don't waste anything here. Dr. Randall thought it would be a pity to waste the blend and suggested we try it anyway. Oddly enough, the chemicals that had been accidentally processed began giving us results entirely different from anything we had used up to that point. Sensational results. All Dr. Randall could say was, amazing, amazing. We have an entrepreneur, and he comes from the very unexpected part of society. Sixth grade education, he was proud of that. I found it interesting that in a, the Oakland telephone book, he was listed as a bulldozer operator and a psychologist with a specialty in alcoholism. What does that say about Jess Ritchie? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I actually believed that the world would come begging for ADX2. But in the spring of 1948, strange things began to happen. Sir, you must know a thing about batteries. Have you heard of ADX2? I know all about your product. I learned that a pamphlet called Letter Circular 302, published by the National Bureau of Standards, was being circulated among battery users. It was actually written in 1931 and was a blanket condemnation of all battery additives. It was spread around in such a way as to give our customers and potential customers the impression that battery ADX2 was a phony. We wrote to the National Bureau of Standards and told them that ADX2 was obtaining amazing results and was already saving major industrial accounts huge sums of money in battery maintenance cost. Our first break came in December 1950. George A.W. Bohm, science editor of Newsweek, reported facts that were highly favorable to ADX2. We were flooded with requests for information and samples from businessmen all over the country. We had received more than 8,000 letters from just about every state in the union.
Pioneer Zinc. How can I help you? You're kidding me. Another one? Thanks for letting us know. In less than a month, the Bureau of Standards was out with a new revised circular on battery additives. Had it not been for this circular, I would have been sitting pretty. This caused the Federal Trade Commission and the Post Office both to issue orders calling for Jess oh. Ritchie to cease and desist. I knew this had to be my last ditch stand against Washington. We ask for only one thing. A complete investigation of prejudice at the National Bureau of Standards and a fair test of ADX2. Alan Aston was a trained physicist raised by a single mother who came to work at the Bureau as a research physicist and really got a big career boost with the work for World War II defense projects. Alan Aston was recognized nationally as a scientist who was key in the development of the radio proximity fuse. And he wasn't looking for trouble with the ADX2 controversy. He simply inherited by virtue of his position as director. I agreed in May 1952 to run a new series of tests on battery ADX2 using a test procedure which Mr. Ritchie guaranteed would demonstrate the merits of this product. I had hoped that the matter could be settled decisively for all concerned. My father personally supervised the new tests. Good morning, Dr. Aston. Good morning, Jack. Herbert? Phyllis, how are we doing? Good morning, Dr. Aston. Good morning, Dr. Aston. Don't let me keep you. Jack, how are we looking? It's going really well. Right on schedule. Good. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Alan. He kept the code indicating which battery was receiving the product and which one was not. And he was the only one that knew which was which. Replicate 3, 1.23. A director of NIST would never do that ordinarily, but he realized how important this was politically. None of the judges, including Mr. Ritchie and his assistant, was able to tell any consistent difference between the treated and untreated batteries. And the result was still the same. Yeah. The product was, it was worthless. We were approached to set up a meeting involving an official of the Senate Small Business Committee, Professor Weber, a chemistry professor from MIT, Mr. Ritchie, and some of our people. Professor Weber had indicated that if we made a different type of test, we might be able to show that the product had some merit. So what do you say? Will you work with us? We believe that unfavorable results would be more acceptable to the proponents of ADX2 if we are not involved. For this reason, we will have to decline your invitation. I knew you were going to say that. We will run these tests at MIT, with or without you, and prove to the American people that ADX2 does work, and provide clear benefit to lead-acid batteries. It was concluded after some serious deliberation that it would be better if the Bureau did not participate in these tests. A major factor influencing this decision was Mr. Ritchie's attitude toward the Bureau and Bureau personnel. He did not believe Bureau personnel could be depended on to have a fair test. MIT people went ahead and made the tests. We weren't involved at all. And they came out with a report which indicated that the product might have some merit. 
the MIT tests weren't as conclusive. And by the way, they were later proven to be of uh, insufficient rigor in their processes. But Keith Laidler, who was a uh, chemistry professor at Catholic University, did an oversight of the MIT test and actually said, as an academic, that the MIT test proved that it worked. But it's fascinating, Keith Laidler was also a paid consultant to Jess Ritchie. These connections never cease to amaze me. It looked like we were in a battle with MIT, with the Senate Small Business Committee, and that we were in trouble. It's important to keep in mind that politics moved into this very rapidly because a dispute between a commercial manufacturer and a scientific agency also involved a new administration that had just come in. The early Eisenhower administration were going to reduce regulations in business. They were going to help the businessman, including the small entrepreneur. They had two businessmen as the Secretary of Commerce and as the Undersecretary for Domestic Affairs. So all of these forces were aligned at the time that Ritchie came in with the perfect story that matched their idea, an idea that if they publicized it would actually put the Department of Commerce as the hero of the common man. I think the National Bureau of Standards has not been sufficiently objective because they discount entirely the play of the marketplace. It can generally be said that there have been no complaints, but on the contrary, many testimonials to the fact that the product is good and has saved the users money. There are generally no adequate measures included in a testimonial, no rigorous specifications of the operating conditions under which the measurements were taken, and usually no controls, whatever, are used. For those reasons, we cannot accept testimonials as scientific evidence. Frankly, we don't know why it works. We have a lot of theory like many other people have about lead-acid batteries. But the only thing that Dr. Randall could ever say was, well, it doesn't. Why? I don't know. <laughs> the Senate Small Business Committee reached the conclusion that we had persecuted this individual. Both the Post Office and the Federal Trade Commission dismissed their own objections to Jess Ritchie selling ADX2 and advertising it. So they really did take the force of the marketplace into consideration. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, Mr. Ritchie, Mr. Ritchie, Mr. Ritchie, Mr. Ritchie, Mr. Ritchie, Mr. Ritchie. Now that the fraud charges have been dropped, what is next for ADX2? I'm gonna pour this material into every battery in the United States. This just in, the Secretary of Commerce Weeks has fired the director of the Bureau of Standards, Dr. Alan V. Aston. He was so hurt by that, that he locked the door of his office for a period of time, refusing to talk to any members of the press because he didn't want to be insubordinate.
But then things happened, which I think surprised everybody. Extract, read all about it. Come and get your papers. It was the top news story in all the papers. Big, bold headlines. You know, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, over batteries? It was a huge scandal. There was this, this mass show of support, not just for him, but for the idea of, you know, don't let politics mess with science. 400 of the top researchers at the Bureau of Standards said that they would immediately leave the Bureau's service under Alan Aston's departure. That, of course, would have brought the entire institution to a halt right away. Internal to the Bureau, there was complete solidarity in support of Aston. Everyone here knew that we were honest and did a competent job. It became political, but my father just never entered the political aspect of it. He stayed away from it and maintained his faith in science. Alan Aston had as conditions for his retention that there be comprehensive and concluding investigations by the National Academy of Sciences to look at the laboratory regimen and tests run by the Bureau of Standards of Battery Additive ADX2. My dad had pointed out, when you follow the directions on the package and give the battery a long, slow charge, you improve the battery whether you add the ADX2 or not. Their conclusions were that the Bureau of Standards did do a comprehensive test, rigorously scientific, and the ineffectiveness of this compound should be accepted by government. No further need exists to seek a successor as Dr. Aston has expressed his willingness and his desire to continue as a key official of this administration. And as such, he is from here on a member of my team. Jess Ritchie launched a suit against the federal government to recover $2.4 million. And it wasn't until 1961 when a federal court dismissed that suit with prejudice, which means that it could not be revived. The Bureau staff believes, first of all, in the importance of scientific research as a means of intellectual and spiritual advancement. Eventually, there was a, a wonderful victory that I think had a lot to do with the way my dad maintained a position of not going to war with anyone, but just standing up for the work of the Bureau. And further believe that the primary incentives and rewards of a civil service scientist are not financial, but rather stem from the pride in organization and its functions, and from the sense of satisfaction which comes from participating, even in small ways, in the solution of problems of national importance. He continued on as director for another 16 years, remained well respected, and perhaps the respect was even enhanced and amplified by his having gone through this ordeal. This ADX2 thing is almost a, a warning in a way. To compromise science because of the marketplace uh, is just uh, suicidal. We believe further that complete freedom of inquiry and scientific investigation is essential to ensure not only the soundness of a particular set of results or conclusions, but also the development and healthy progress of science itself. Integrity in any aspect of life often has a quiet voice, not speaking loudly or dramatically, but it's always proven out in the long term. 
it is my conclusion that uh, even though the, uh, the hiatus uh, that I went through, the forced resignation, the temporary reinstatement, the permanent reinstatement were uh, things I wouldn't want to be to go through again, I, I think the Bureau came out of it stronger than when it went in. public opinion, given enough time, it will diminish and it will change, but the scientific evidence stays.